Hello and welcome to Jetter Technologies presentation entitled Evolve to Errands. My name is Jay Prado. I've been an application engineer here for about 12 years, which has been a really great edu education in uh, container rinsing. Also joining me today is Rob Miotti. How are you doing, Rob? Good, Jay. He's Thanks. our general manager. Thank you very much. Container rinsing is a hot topic. And before we get too deep into it, I want to let everybody know that if you do have any questions at any time, feel free to type them into the chat and you can, uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can later. So uh, today we're gonna investigate a less expensive, more effective way to clean your containers prior to rinsing, okay? And we're gonna try and answer two questions. The first question is, can those tough standards that the, the quality beverage packers have out there, can they be met through blower-based air? Gotcha. And the other one is, what's it cost? So Jay, tell us a little bit about the history, if you would, of container rinsing. Sure, it's a, it's a brief history, but uh, you know, obviously container rinsing has been around since uh, package processing has been around. You want clean containers. The way it used to be done is you just rinse the containers out with water. So any debris or foreign material that was inside of there was removed before it was filled. Debris or foreign material, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean? Uh, unfortunately, a long list of things. Uh, that list would typically include like dust from cardboard, everything shipped in cardboard, styrofoam pieces, plastic. Uh, then it can get a little grosser. You can get insects, bits, pieces, entire insects. And then it can even go up to like full dead mice and rodents and things like that. So. And, and did you say styrofoam dots and things like that? Too? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's one method of quantification that's pretty typically used as a, a styro dot test. And oh, cool. There's a few others, but yeah. All right. That sounds difficult. Yeah. So um, you also say, you say that water was the historical medium for, for removing these foreign materials from the containers. Mm -hmm. uh, when did it go from water to air? Uh, pretty shortly after. So compressed air was readily available at plants. Now compressed air is a really highly pressurized airstream, but it's also very thin. Mm. So that thin airstream was able to enter the cans and clean out very specific parts of it. Kind of like a needle. Exactly. Yeah. So then after that, you know, they decided, well, we need to get all of this out, obviously. So ion bars were introduced to that to help mm. with some of the static charge that was inside of the container mm. to remove the product. Yeah. Or, excuse me, material. So, um, it wasn't long after that that people moved to blower-based air? No, pretty pretty quickly, pretty easily. You know, blowers are another commodity that's widely available on site. Now, when you go to blower-based air, one of the, the best things or the benefits you get is high CFM. Now, high CFM works a lot better for clearing things out because it's not that thin pinpoint pressured air. It's actually a much wider and more volumous yeah. amount of air coming through. So you're able to clear the entire container out a lot easier. So the switch from compressed to blower-based air, while has been a little slow, people pretty quickly picked up on that. Yeah, so, yeah, I can see the advantage. Right, so, you know, that's all the performance. So we know, you know, we've kind of gone from water to compressed air and then to blower air. So uh, what about cost savings? Cost, There's yeah. gotta be some money involved in all three of those. Right, so uh, it's true calculating your ROI can be tricky with this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna generalize numbers because, you know, they vary widely depending upon who you are, where you buy your water, where you buy your electricity. Mm -hmm. So. First, you have to know what you're currently spending, and not just on the primary cost, like the cost of water, but also on the secondary cost. So in this case, it would be like um, the cost of pumping the water. That would be a secondary cost. Okay. So the primary cost of water can any, be as little as like $25,000 a year per line, but is, it can grow to like $200,000 a year per Ouch. line. Yeah. yeah. And the secondary cost associated with that can be very expensive as well. Imagine taking the water out of a reservoir and uh, or some sort of uh, on-site reservoir, mm -hmm. pumping it into the uh, water jets, and then once it's been all used up, sending it out to some treatment facility. Just the, the electri electrical costs along with, for the pumping mm -hmm. uh, can be as much as what it costs for blower-based air. Now, um, the, you know, you're not only using uh, all that electricity, but you're also using up that resource, right? Water, where you yeah. have a bunch of water. Okay. And, uh, if the cost is twenty-five to two hundred thousand dollars, we want to save that money for the operator mm -hmm. because that can then provide a bonus for the plant manager. Ah, no, no one's complaining about yeah. that, I'm sure. Uh, so that's the water side of things in terms of cost. What about compressed air? So compressed air, the, the savings are dramatic as well. Maybe not so much as water, but the cost to run a compressor and deliver that compressed air to one nozzle can be as uh, from five to seven thousand dollars per year. For one nozzle. Steep. Yeah. yeah. 
So they have five to seven nozzles, so the costs are anywhere from $25,000 a year to 50 or $49,000 a year. Okay. And uh, a typical system um, it gets expensive, right? Uh, the good news is that you're not using up water anymore, mm -hmm. but you are introducing uh, oil or grease through the compressed air system into the containers that you just tried cleaning. Okay, so a little counterintuitive with the, the compressed air, you have a right. couple of extra steps even to get clean air to the containers. That's right. Yeah. So if we're gonna summarize the costs right now, we're looking at water about 55 to 200,000, so pretty large yeah, variance right. there. And then there's a compressed air at about 25,000 or more. What happens when we compare those numbers to, or excuse me, lower base air? Two to three thousand dollars a year. That's it. That's all. The whole wow. end of story. Okay. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. So it would seem that's an easy decision. Then why is everyone not jumping onto this immediately? There must be some obstacles. Yeah, phone should be ringing off the, the hook. Right. People yeah. banging down the doors. Right. So what happened? What one of the biggest obstacles is downtime. Mm -hmm. People don't want the, all that downtime required to do the changeover to blower based air. Gotcha. And the other obstacle, uh, believe it or not, is. Um, the hassle of retrofitting your current system to blower-based system. Okay, well, I, I have a little bit of insider knowledge on this one, uh, but does Jet Air include those retrofitting costs inside yeah, their system? it's part of the system cost. Right. We assume that we're going to be doing retrofitting for you. So they're really trying to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Now, we should probably change subjects here and move to the science behind ionized air. Oh, rinsing. my favorite part. And Jay, didn't it used to be called magic air? It did, and these gloves are for uh, no magic trick, but they are for a nice demonstration here. Okay, so, so you're putting on, you're putting on uh, the Putting on gloves. some gloves. So uh, ionized air, you, you know, through misunderstanding, a lot of times was called uh, magic air, as uh -huh. you said. So obviously, you can't see this field of ions, so that kind of led people to, to call it that. But what's actually going on is all the debris, let's say our uh, cardboard dust, our styrofoam pieces, our insect pieces, and all of those kind of things, they're attracted to the can because the can has a charge on it. The can develops a how, charge. How does that go? Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, the can develops a charge just through friction, just being on the line and moving through the line. It's going to pick up a charge uh, by rubbing up against everything else in the plant. So. Okay, so you've got a container. It's got a charge on it. Yes. And the dust and whatnot's attracted to that charge. And the I, Yep, and the ion bar is designed. Not to help you put your gloves on, though I wish <laughs> you're, it was. You're scaring me a little bit. Yeah, but it's designed to remove that charge. So we are going to show you how that works, though. So we've got a little box here. Okay. Thank you, Lego. Empty box. Yeah. And some parsley. Okay. All right, so we're going to take this parsley. I'm just going to spread some of that around. Okay, that's, and then, a, that's a good amount of parsley. Yeah. Is that what a typical container would get? Just one? Container? No, no, this is way overkill. Yeah, this All is right. way overkill. So then we're going to create some static charge, and we're going to do that just by creating some friction and, and moving our cups past one another. So we'll do that for a sec to get this nice and charged up. Now, some lines have a really, really strong charge. So this isn't too far up from what you would see in terms of a charge goes. So once you get that charged up, you're going to hold it over the parsley. Yes. And it's going to be like a willy, a woolly willy where it's going to jump on. Exactly. The All the kids in Halloween. Yeah. On Halloween day, would be very happy. So we'll go ahead and. Oh, I can hear it jumping on there. You can hear it jump and yeah. kind of crackle onto the container there. Just kind of floats on and i'll go ahead and put that up to the screen you oh, can wow. see our parsley is on the can if i go and put it back on here you can hear more attach because wow. we still have a charge then i'm going to come down over here now this is our ionizing bar okay so what we're going to do is we're going to wave this bar in front of the container and you're actually going to see the charge uh, dissipate and the material fall off so here we go oh wow look at that so it all just falls off now what the really cool part is and what the purpose of the iron bar is, if I go and I put this container next nothing's to the parcel again, there. nothing's there's jumping back no. onto the container. That's amazing. So that's a really good example of what the iron bar is doing for your iron. So system. not magic air. Not magic air at all. Yep. So you can really see uh, the loss of the static magnetism in that demonstration. Uh, the next thing I was thinking about is uh, all of the uh, ambient air that's in my plant, right? Right. So there could be all kinds of contaminants, beer stones, sugars in there. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you handle that? Uh, yeah, filtration is a big deal and uh, it's not thought out. It could be an even bigger deal. So we may have an image for you. If not, you can check it out on our website. Uh, there's there's a couple filters inside of our system, one of them being the main filter, which is our beverage filter. Now that's going to filter out big particulates like the beer stone you mentioned, the sugar. That's the blue one. That's correct. That is the blue one you're seeing on screen there. 
And then we also have our HEPA filter. Now our HEPA filter is filtering things out up to 0.3 microns. Wow. This is tiny stuff. This is bacteria, spores, and other things like that. Things so, you don't, wouldn't normally think about. Right, exactly. So this is very clean air. So we learned a long time ago that to have clean containers, you need clean air. So when I look at the image, I see those great big bolts mm -hmm. on that black circle. Right. Well, what, what, what are you doing? Yeah, that can look a little overbuilt, right? Um, it's not. Uh, it is a bit intimidating, but what it's designed to do is be a pressure vessel, and uh, that sounds a little serious, but we're just making sure that uh, no air gets in or out of that filter, that, yeah. that all air that we're taking in comes out through the HEPA filter. Uh, this is actually what's used in a lot of medical clean rooms. So, wow. Yeah. So you have a lot of experience with pressure and flow. You're working here 12 years, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, this particular blower that you specified for this system has a little bit uh, different blower curve than what we use for drying. It does. Uh, jet air can be a little persnickety with our blower selection for the right application. So we really take into consideration what types of CFM and pressure is going to work. Uh, for this one particularly, is a little different, like you said, than our, our drying blowers. So this one is going to carry pressure at a further distance. Mm -hmm. So cans that are maybe long and skinny or a little too wide, whatever it may be, that we're able to hit all surfaces inside of there. So okay. Yeah. And and you mentioned earlier air components. Mm -hmm. um, I have something for that. Yeah. Excellent. So, How'd I know? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is one of our air components. Uh, this is not what you will see on a lot of competitors or other people's lines. Typically, you'll see what is called an air blade or an air knife. Now that's a flat blade and it shoots a flat uh, sheet of air out. Yeah, It's not something you would really want in an air and system. It won't get that deep either, right? Exactly. So yeah. that's why we were talking about earlier about shooting into the can. So what we do is we have these geometrically designed nozzles to carry flow uh, very well actually over a distance and keep its pressure. So that's that's what this little setup here is. You know, instead of the blade, we like these nozzles. Okay, so when do you uh, introduce ionization into the process. Right. So the ionization actually happens at the same time. So the ion bar will sit uh, almost perpendicular with the container, but shooting kind of into the airstream here. Okay. Now what's happening then is we're creating a field of ions above the nozzles. That air is carrying that field into the container and making sure that we have no charge after wow. that. So once we have no charge, the particulate or foreign material can drop out. It ends up in a vacuum bag and can be taken away. Taken away. Mm -hmm. So the container travels across these jet blasts and ionized air is essentially cleaning and demagnetizing, if you will, mm -hmm. the container, and then it gets ready to accept fresh product. Exactly. You clean fresh product, ready to go. So any dust, powder, whatever that junk is, again, is going to drop into the box and be taken away. Got it. So uh, I think we want to go, I don't know how much time we have left, but let's talk about the sensors on the machine. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the philosophy behind the pro this product is that uh, we believe it might be one of the most important products on the line, the thing that cleans the inside of containers prior to filling it with your product. It makes sure that the brand is protected. Therefore, it always needs to be working. And because it's air and electricity, you can't see it working. So we put monitors, sensors, and gauges just about everywhere. Okay, so let's let's start somewhere. Let's start with the, the filtration sensor. All right, so the ION3 monitor is a differential pressure between the filters. And I think on the screen, you probably are seeing a couple of gauges. Um, it monitors the air pressure uh, before it enters the filter and after it measures the differential pressure. And those gauges tell you just how full those filters are. Gotcha. So you know when it's time to change. You're never going to have dirty air unless you're being negligent. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, gotcha. Especially the HEPA filtration, right? You want right. to make sure that's clean. Uh, what about our blowers? I know sure. you want protection on those yeah. as well. We put sensors on the blower. If the blower stops operating, then a warning light will go on and the operator will be able to see it real easily. Also, a code appears on the uh, BFD. Okay, cool. Um, and then one last part of the equipment. What about the ion bars? Obviously, there should yeah. be some protection there as well. Probably one of the most important things you want to monitor is whether your ion bar is working. Okay. And so we put monitors on that. There's a monitor right there on the base unit. The operator can see if something's wrong just in case it's it's uh, not being uh, monitored by an operator. Mm -hmm. um, there is a monitor light way up on top on the debris box. Oh, wow. So you can see that from across the plant. So anybody can tell you that your right. ion bar is not working, which is really important, I think. So it's, it's almost hard to miss when something goes wrong, if it goes wrong with the system, it sounds yeah, like. The safety and importance of the customer's brand is paramount. Okay. Uh, and I know also when customers are out shopping for these kind of things, of course, they're looking at sensors and protection and things like that, but they're also looking at uh, material handling and conveyance. 
And a lot of people don't like to shop around between this contractor and that. Does Jitter offer anything in that regard? Sure. If a customer doesn't want us to retrofit their current line and they want a new uh, a new method for material handling, mm -hmm. uh, we, we have some really cool options, several. Um, we sub out to some experts in the industry. We're particularly excited about this one company out of Germany called HF Meyer mm -hmm. that um, has a product called the High Arrow. And okay. uh, it uses um, a vacuum technology for cans only. Um, where the cans never touch, and if you have to change sizes with the cans, you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about it. There's no changeover, and uh, we're, we're really excited to see what happens. Yeah. No gravity is required either, so, so it could all be on the same floor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, HF Meyer, did yeah. I get that right? Okay. HF Meyer on the high arrow. So no damaging of the cans, less line space because yeah. you're not stacked up. Sounds That's cool. quite a plug for HF Meyer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we set out to answer two questions during this uh, event today, Rob. Uh, one of them was, can the standards of the world's beverage packagers be met without wasting our resources? Very important to us Californians. Yeah. And is the solution cost effective? And I think through everything we went today, uh, it's very clear that Cheddar has a great understanding of container rinsing and how to achieve the results that you know any company needs. Not only that, it's not going to take you years to get your ROI back. Yeah. So it's really cool. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, it was a pleasure to do this. Thanks, Jay. Yeah.